Okay, let's see if we can break up all the chat and get everyone back to their seats. Such a horrible thing when we like talking to each other. So, um, at the beginning of the month, uh, this awesome team of people got to head out to Honduras uh, on a mission trip, which is the first one that we've done since, since the pandemic happened. So, it was really fun to get back there. Um, actually, I'm going to sit down because I feel weird standing up with everyone else sitting down. So, uh, so we're going to sit around the living room. So, what we wanted to do today is take time. Like, people were really impacted by the trip and we wanted to take time to let you hear the stories of what God was doing in everybody. Um, but before we go there, there were a couple of things I wanted to do. And one is just root what we're about to do now in the series that we're in in First Timothy. Um, so next week, we're going to be looking at this part of the passage that continues where we've been. Um, but as I was thinking about what we're doing today, as people are sharing stories, I realized that what we're going to see is like a lived example of what this passage is talking about. So uh, Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he says, command those who are rich... We don't always feel like it, but that's us. Command those who are rich to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Um, I think it's important to remind us, this team went to Honduras as a representative group of our church. So it wasn't just us that were there. Our church was in Honduras. Your money, your prayers, uh, your encouragement was all part of what made this happen. So all of us uh, were living out this passage by nature sending this team overseas. So what we're going to do now is just hear this lived out. What does it look like for those who are rich to give generously and be willing to share? Uh, And then we all get to sit and reap the benefits and the rewards of that. Um, I want to do a quick geography lesson. We went to Honduras. Not everyone knows where these countries are. Um, I used to have some friends that went to Nicaragua when I was living in Scotland. And I thought it was in Africa. And I had another friend that went to Bolivia, which I also thought was in Africa. Um, So I didn't want to assume that people knew where this is. So you can see the U.S. there. You can see Mexico. You can see the Honduran flag right there in the middle of Honduras. So when we're talking about going to Honduras, we weren't in Africa. We were right there. Um, But what I want to do, um, I want to have some people just, just answer this question. What did we do? So before we get into sharing stories, someone want to tell us, what, what we did. You want to tell us what you guys did and then the guys can tell us what they did? Yeah, so I'll talk about what the gals did. And this was by our choice because we could have done anything. But for those of you who know me, I don't do dirt. So um, I was very happy to be in the classroom uh, working with the kids and then in the afternoons we met with the moms. So in the mornings we did hygiene and Jesus class. It was kind of like a VBS in some ways. Um, And then uh, in the afternoons, uh, the moms from the community came in and we ministered to them in some really amazing ways. So you want to give it to Mark? Give her Joe. Um, And so the guys, um, being big brutes that we are, operated this gigantic piece of equipment to drill a uh, wonderful well um, so that this community had uh, easier access to uh, clean, drinkable water. They, um, until that point, uh, getting access to this water was um, a a lot more difficult, and uh, we were successful in bringing them one of the largest, one of the most uh, volume producing water uh, wells in uh, a long time, I think, for the, the crew there. So we, we got to uh, enjoy that part as, as well. Yeah. So uh, you're going to hear some stories of how the trip impacted us. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Ron and let Ron share a little bit about his experience. I need to read mine. <laughs> so uh, 
make sure you've got the mic. Yeah. Um, I knew that Honduras was going to be hot. <laughs> and it was. It was humid. It was brutally humid. And, um, you know, I was not ready for it. I definitely was not ready for it. <laughs> and um, I never experienced like anything like that in my life. And, um, and but um, I will go on and say the Agua Viva staff, they were absolutely incredible. From the, They were just amazing people. From the time we were picked up at the airport and when we left, they treated us like family. Every time we were on the bus, either going to the village or even going to some place to eat. We were always broke out in worship songs. Um, we even learned a, new, a few new ones, um, which are pretty funny, actually. <laughs> they were uh, so much in the spirit, and it made me do a lot of thinking where I was personally. Every morning at the hotel, we would meet by the pool for devotional. Again, we would sing. And um, that actually took up part of the, most of the morning. <laughs> It was just really cool. Um, it was because of all of this, I felt more open to step outside of myself and share more freely. Um, when the day was done and we were back at the hotel and gathering for dinner, um, we always had a debrief and we had to share our highlight of the day. Um, one, night when I was sh one night when I shared my highlight, I broke down in tears. To be honest, I don't remember exactly what I said. <laughs> um, the whole experience was definitely life-changing and very emotional for me. I was able to set aside that introverted, introverted part of myself because I felt very connected to the people who I was serving with, and you know that flowed into my that flowed into my experience with the kids at the school, who I just absolutely fell in love with. Normally, I probably would have stand back, stayed back and let others interact. But I really felt like God taking my hand and basically dragging me over to the sea of kids where they were playing. I let go at that point of my any insecurities and just played. You soon realize that kids are kids no matter where they are in the world. They want love and attention and to know they are special. I came away from this experience with my heart full and a very changed outlook. The standout moment was definitely when I introduced myself to the kids. I told them my name was Ron, and they didn't seem to like that name. I didn't know why, but they cringed a little. And I'm not, um, I'm not sure if it was my name Ron or if maybe they heard me wrong. At first, I was a little hurt, but that was okay. I thought, oh, they're just kids. Maybe they're just messing with me. <laughs> um, Scotty over here, he then stepped in and told my name was Ron Ronaldo. They really liked that. <laughs> and um, from, that, from that moment on, um, my name was Ronaldo. They really seemed to like that a lot better. From, um, each time we arrived back at the school, I would hear one of the kids yell, Ronaldo! And I would either get a big hug or a pinch or both in the ribs. And, um, you know, it was just an amazing experience. Very emotional for me. I don't think I ever experienced that much of a, a love with so many people. These kids are just, um, you know, they're just, de you know, I don't know, I wouldn't say desperate, but they're just so, um, they want love and they want to be loved. And, um, you know, I just was really happy and, and so glad to be part of that experience. Gracias, Ronaldo. <laughs> I'm serious. Ronaldo is the new him. Yeah, yeah. It, it suits him really well. So um, I've seriously never been hugged as many times as I have in any given day that I was at that school. You'd walk in the front door, well, for the front gate, um, and kids would just start coming up and hugging you, and, and it's Buenos dias. Um, hola, and they're just, they're hugging on you every which direction, you're just kind of going like this the whole time, um, and it was just fabulous, and then at the end of the day, when they were heading home, um, it was more hugs, 
and um, then it was adios. And, and it, but anytime you saw the, these kids were just always touching you and hugging you, and it was fabulous. So this little cutie pie on, on the left, this is Lucas. Um, I think he's in fourth grade. Um, and in that classroom, they are learning English. Um, and so they know a few words. They probably know more words in English than I do in Spanish. Um, and so uh, we were handing out crayons because they were doing um, a couple of craft projects. And um, so the, I, was, I had a bag full of crayons and, and the kids had come up and they'd ask me. And they'd ask for me, they asked me in, um, you know, for what they wanted or they'd just start digging and it didn't matter. And so um, Lucas comes up and asks for yellow. And so I pulled out the yellow and I said, in Espanol, por favor? Very proud of myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> takes very little to make me proud. And he said, Amarillo. And I said, Amarillo. <laughs> and he went, mmm, Amarillo. I mangled it every time. He finally said, ah, ma, re, jo. And so I went, ah. He's like, mm, ah, ah, ma, ma, re, re, jo, jo. Patiently taking me syllable by syllable through this. And I finally went, ah, ma, re, jo. And he went, bien. <laughs> so this little boy just, stole his way into my heart and seriously how can you not love that little face um, anyway the other picture is Jose um, Jose yeah, is in the same classroom but I think he might be a couple years older um, when we first walked into that classroom he and his buddy were sitting at the back doing this they were not gonna smile they were not going to engage. They were not going to interact. They were too, school, too cool for school. They were just going to tolerate us being there. Well, <laughs> Jill has a way. Jill is one of the Agua Viva workers who is just, oh, what a heart that woman has. She, she has a way of engaging the kids, and she had them sing this ridiculous song, and she had us go, and it has body motions where you thumbs up, elbows out, I forget all the motions, but at the part where it says, butt in the air, there's a little bit of a smile out of those boys. <laughs> so we, you know, go through that and go through that. And, it, and then we hand out um, the crafts. And so there are two pictures that they um, are going to color and put onto a, a piece of cardstock. You know, we've got the cardstock two hole punched. And so they're all coloring and we're handing out crayons and I'm interacting with Lucas and, and doing all of this. And all of a sudden, these two boys are just dying laughing. Um, Jose's buddy is ribbing him, poking him, just going nuts on him and laughing. And Jill comes over to me and she says, I need another kit uh, for the cross. And I said, sure. So I dig it out. He, she says, this boy glued his on upside down and his buddy is giving him a bad time about it. And, he, and she said to him, well, Peter chose to be crucified upside down because of his love of Christ. And so the buddy says, I'm going to call you Pedro. So this boy becomes Pedro. So we tease him, you know, they're teasing him. And I said, I want that. I want this. And I looked at him and I said, I'm taking this home. I'm hanging it on my wall. And I will think of you. And that was kind of the end of the interaction. And then the class ends. And a million kids are hugging me. They're all coming up and adios, adios. And I'm hugging. And all of a sudden, a taller hug happens across my shoulders. Jessica saw it. I actually didn't see it. I just looked over my shoulder and it was Jose came up and hugged me. Ron said it. These kids want to be loved. 
They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be loved. Um, I was trying to pick a story to talk about, um, and kind of along with the, the theme so far, uh, you know, the joy and appreciation that we got from the kids is, is really hard to, to not talk about, but I was part of the well team, um, so I just kind of want to talk about, you know, the challenges that that they face um you know in america we would never choose to build a home somewhere where there wasn't water and sewer and in all of the utilities that you know we would have access to um but in honduras this well this is the well that we drilled this is the, the finished product um we were drilling for water for one of 218 villages in this el progreso kind of area. So basically, if, by, by area, we're talking Portland proper, Hillsborough, and Beaverton. There's 218 villages that needed, that had no source of fresh water, right? So you think about the country as a whole and how great that need is. Um, you know, we, when we got all done, and, and this is the final product, we, we did the celebration with, with the village. Um, there are hundreds of people at this celebration for th this hand pump well, right? It's nothing, nothing automatic. You've got to come over here and work to get water out. And there are hundreds of people here to celebrate. Um, you know, and I, I asked the, the local Aquaviva people, well, why didn't we put like a solar pump or something on this, right? And he said, well, the village has this, this vision, this goal of installing a tank so that we can distribute this water to the whole village and it's a you know that sounds great it sounds simple um but the reality is they were after we finished this well they started to raise money to put the electricity in then once they did that they would have to raise money for the pump and then they'd have to raise money for the tank and then raise money for the piping to get it around the village and then once it was around the village, you had to get it into the homes, right? Do all of the plumbing. And depends where you look, but the average income for the people of Honduras is somewhere between $2,700 and $4,000 a year. So you think about a government that, you know, is corrupt enough that it can't reliably provide these resources to these people. They've got to do it for themselves, and they have very little income to do it. Uh, so coming out of that, right, seeing the need, um, you know, I, I, I felt a little bit of despair. Um, and, and I think, I, you know, I would have stayed there. Um, but the fact that, you know, we can trust in a God who hears our prayers and is moving in his own ways, um, you know, this school that we were at had a couple of, we'll call them bathrooms, um, you know, you had to dump water in the toilets to get them to flush. Um, so, you know, stretch, stretch of the definition of, of bathroom there. But it was set up and ready to go. So there was a group that had come in from Norway previous to us, a couple years previous, and they had built these bathrooms, right? So the way that we think in the Western world, that's terrible project management, right? Well, why would you build a bathroom before there's any plumbing, any water? Um, but the reality is, is, is God's at work here, right? He knows where these people need to come from, the skills that they have, so that at the end of the day, you know, he can, he will make sure that these people are, are taken care of. Um, and, and it's hard for me as an individual, I want to solve every problem and get in there and stay till the work is done. Um, and that's just, that's not the reality. The reality is that I have to have faith in the God who's going to take care of it for me. So similar to what Kim was talking about, um, the hugs just um, really caught me by surprise. And that was one thing that stood out to me um, throughout the week. You know, Monday morning was our first morning in the village. And um, 
that it, it just it, it goes so fast and you're you're running all over the classroom handing out supplies and collecting supplies and admiring completed work and um, you know there were cries of Jessica Jessica from all over the classroom <laughs> and and that particular classroom that for, that we were in that first day um, was not air conditioned so the the time ends and I'm a little, you know, the school ends at noon and the kids are starting to head home. And I am a little worn out already. I am extremely sweaty. Um, and um, kind of walking out of the classroom in a bit of a daze. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's just this little pair of arms wrapped around my waist as this little boy ran up and, and gave me a hug. And that was, that was kind of my first experience with what, as Kim described, became a normal experience throughout the week. But it, um, yeah, it, it um, surprised me at that moment. Um, and throughout the week, I, I went with the goal of making the kids and the women that we worked with in the afternoons feel seen and loved. That was what I wanted to do. Um, yet I found throughout the week that I, I was held back by some things. Um, some of the same hesitancy that I deal with here of not wanting to be awkward and clumsy. Um, language was an issue. I, I, you know, I, on, completely on my own, before I had even thought about coming on this trip, um, back in March, I had started teaching myself Spanish just for fun. And so I knew a little bit, very little bit of uh, beginning Spanish. And on the first day or two, I kind of had fun um, trying out my limited uh, vocabulary. Um, but even when I could ask a question like, what is your name? I couldn't understand the answer. Um, <laughs> And, you know, even just simple things like that. Like there was a little boy we all hung, spent a lot of time with that hung around, uh, Justin. The first day I thought his name, I couldn't figure out what his name was. I asked him twice and the best I could come up with was Rafine. Um, for, <laughs> so um, it, it just, I, I, I was really struggling. And so I stopped trying to use my Spanish as much. Um, and on Wednesday, the craft we had for the kids was, were these uh, paper bag puppets. And um, this little girl, she had kind of quickly become my favorite. Um, <laughs> and on Thursday morning, Kim and I, the next day, Kim and I were in the classroom handing something out. And she pulled that puppet out to show me that she had brought it um, back and wanted to show me. And so I took that picture. And I wanted to ask her name, because we'd interacted a couple times, but I had never asked. And then I decided not to, because I thought, I'm not going to understand it even when she does answer me. And I can pray for, God knows who I mean if I just say my favorite little girl. Um, <laughs> and so I, I just, I didn't do it. I let the opportunity pass. And this was Thursday, was, our, was to be our last day in the village. And so... Um, when that day came to an end, I, I kind of kicked myself a little bit that, that I hadn't taken that opportunity, but it, it was okay. Friday was supposed to be a sightseeing day, but <laughs> Thursday night when we were talking, we all voted to go back to the village instead and play with the kids some more. And uh, the teachers were okay with that, so we did. We, we arrived Friday morning after we had said goodbye to all the kids Thursday afternoon. And we were literally mobbed at the gate to the schoolyard as we got off the bus. Like we couldn't get through the gate because there were so many kids thronged around us trying to give us a hug. Um, once I finally get, got into the schoolyard, this little girl um, came up and, and gave me a hug and, and said hello. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to let the opportunity go by again. And so I asked her what her name was. Sure enough, I didn't understand it. <laughs> and I asked her again, and she repeated it again, and I still didn't know what she said. And 
then I got a brilliant idea, and I pulled out my phone, and I handed her my phone, and I, I, I have enough words to be able to say, write your name. And so she wrote her name in my phone. Her name is Valeria. And, um, and so then after, uh, you know, we just played with the kids for about an hour, but uh, um, in the heat and humidity, I quickly tired out after playing for a little bit. And Kim and I were, there's a stage at the end of the schoolyard, and Kim and I went and sat on the stage at the end of the schoolyard, and we were sitting there talking, and, and as we were sitting there, suddenly I hear, I, I mean, I feel fingers running through my hair, and I look, and it's Valeria standing behind me playing with my hair. And so we just kept talking, and pretty soon she leans over and she says something, and I figured it out that she was asking if she could braid my hair. And... So I said yes, and so she braided my hair, and she ended up braiding like Kim's hair and a few other as, as well. Um, but then she came back over and sat next to me, and we had a conversation in within the limits of my very beginning Spanish. You know, she asked me if I had any kids, and I told them my kids' ages, and I asked her if she had any siblings. She didn't. I was going through my phone to, uh, to find pictures of my kids real quick. And as I was doing so, I ran across a picture I had from a project I'd worked on where it was a picture of Ron and I at my senior prom. And so I pulled up that picture and I pointed to it and I said it was Ronaldo and me. And when I pointed to myself and said 18, she she got a kick out of it. Her eyes she grinned. She <laughs> she thought that was she thought that was great. But it was just a neat little conversation. Very simple. It didn't go very deep because I could, didn't have the words. But she was enjoying the attention, and so was I. And it was just because I was willing to be a little bit awkward. So uh, the Im my image uh, requires a little in uh, a little advanced ad introduction, um, but I'm gonna and I'm gonna start off by saying like this is my first mission trip. Um, I uh, my my wife Jennifer had uh, convinced me that uh, she, she knowing my affinity for uh, traveling to distant places, um, uh, I had an I have an affinity for you know construction type projects to help people ask me about Eagle projects later. Um, she, uh, she, she convinced me to go, and uh, I wasn't entirely sure what to expect. Um, you know, I was uh, obviously expecting, you know, you know, lots of prayer, worship, um, fellowship, and, and reflections. Um, but what I wasn't expecting was uh, the amount of energy the Agua Viva team uh, put into uh, the, the program. Um, as I think Ron mentioned earlier, you know, this, the songs that they introduced us to and uh, it just um, was, was really great to be able to, uh, to get be involved in. Um, Dennis, I think, could record uh, songs on, on record. He had a wonderful voice. Now, I'm not the most outgoing person. Um, I'm generally fairly content kind of working in the, in the background, um, doing what's needed to be done. And uh, while we were assured the Aqua Viva team was going to be there, uh, even if we weren't successful while we were there, I still felt like it was going to be a blessing for us to be successful while we were present. And so, um, that was, the drilling process was basically my focus. I, I still tried to break away to play soccer with the kids, um, but it, it made it more difficult for me to be able to connect, not being able to speak the language or um, really want to bother a translator to hang out with me so I could, I could make that connection. So I, you know, I, I did what I could. Um, so I, I wasn't really expecting to have this like groundbreaking moment of spiritual connection uh, on this trip until we saw just clean water gushing out of the well uh, from the earth, right? 
But that, that changed on uh, Tuesday, however, around lunchtime. Uh, a few of us, uh, uh, maybe a couple, I don't remember exactly, but uh, we'd stayed behind while the others had started lunch to make sure we finished the augering process, which basically uh, widened the well for the casing. And um, once, once I got the last uh, uh, drill piece attached, I went and uh, joined the others in the uh, classroom to enjoy the wonderful AC that was uh, uh, provided there. It was the, the, the room was the best one for the AC. Um, and uh, while I, when I entered, I, I, everybody had chosen a seat and I saw that there was a, a desk with a lunch on it. Nobody seemed to be, uh, have claimed it. So I went ahead and sat down. I ate roughly two thirds of it and I gave it to a kid that was uh, hanging out, which was something uh, many of us were doing, was giving um, our spare food to the kids. Um, and uh, after a little while, we were still kind of taking a break. The Agua Viva team had broke into um, uh, singing the gospel. And I had uh, shifted my uh, phone and napkin to the side and saw this, this image. Um, and I, you know, I, I said to myself, oh, this is cool. I'm, I sat into, a, in, into someone's desk with, uh, my name on it. Um, and Joseph is my my full legal name, but uh, I was suddenly hit with the real realization about the way it was written that uh, really caught me off guard. And I'm not sure if anyone here can uh, recognize it. Uh, very few probably would, but um, uh, it's a little harder to tell, I think, because of the, the framing here. But my uh, the the person that wrote it is left-handed, and this is, this had a really impactful. Mo this was a really impactful moment. While everyone was uh, singing the gospel, um, the reason why that's important is because I'm I also write left-handed, and um, that uh, just hit me with all kinds of connection to this uh, to this particular trip and what we were doing there. Uh, God was really speaking because of, of, of this uh, being on there. And it, um, it just, it made me give, it have uh, an, af an affinity also for the, the student that wrote this because, you know, writing as a left-handed person in a right-handed world is that much more difficult, let alone all the difficulties that these kids already face in a day-to-day -day life. Um, so that, that connection um, was also uh, something that was just really hitting me hard. And then um, I was also hit with, you know, he wasn't using a short form like a, uh, of the name that I, I generally use. And the, the calling out of the full name hit me with, uh, you know, a, a famous um, stepdad in the Bible and my calling to be a stepdad myself for 16 years and with who you know my stepson he started school for his second year of college just this last week so i i just it it provided an extra level of connection uh, i think um, for this this whole event um and uh don't don't get me wrong i would love to have shared an image like uh, many have of you guys of of uh, a personal connection I made with a student there, um, but I, I felt like this was really the moment. This just was kind of eye-opening for me. Um, but anyway, later this day, it wasn't that much longer. We, you know, pulled the drill. Oh, <laughs> you included it anyways. That's fine. I, I like. Uh, I, I I was not shy about getting dirty. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, yeah. Um, I just covered in slurry. Uh, it was this was this was actually the day before, and I hadn't uh, I hadn't brought a spare change of clothes, <laughs> so that was an interesting trip back in the bus. <laughs> so, um, but the next day I had spare change of clothes, and and we pulled the drill out later that afternoon after the Tuesday lunch, and uh, we installed the casing, and then uh, on Wednesday we were getting the water out and. Uh, they told us, you know, we measured officially 194 gallons per minute, 
but uh, the guy that, uh, Matthias, who was our lead driller, he, he basically, because of the difficulty we had in getting the uh, water to come out, he, he told us he, we, we think we can get 300, 350 gallons of water out of that well, which um, it, you know, we'll be able to supply that entire community and potentially even then some, um, the water that they need. Um, they were thinking uh, they were gonna have to do two wells, but um, because of the volume that this water, this well can deliver, it's, uh, you know, that much more. So um, they, they'll, they'll have more than enough once they have the in infrastructure in place. Well, I wanna share more to you about the spiritual warfare that goes for us to be able to do this work. Mm -hmm. When it was first announced that um, there was an opportunity to go to Honduras, my heart just started pounding. And uh, you know, all these memories of the work that I'd done before just came flashing down my mind and thinking, gosh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity you've given me again to go and do what I do, what you have equipped me to do. So I created all this agenda in my head. I created all these workshops and all these worship songs and I just work hard for the time that we had to prepare. And when we got over there, everything went down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it's not gonna be the way I want it to be? What do you mean I'm not gonna do what you, I, what I prepare for, right? And it was, I was so disappointed and I was so heartbroken and th the things were not going the way I wanted them to be. And I remember crying out with my Ruby Kim, why, why? <laughs> it's not the way that I want it to be. And you know what? Um, the spirit just, just got a hold of me and started speaking to me and saying, it's not about you, it's about me. And just be willing and able. And the first day, I was everybody's translator. They would get me from one room and kick me out of that room and take me to another room, get me out of that room and then get me out. And what is she saying? And what are they saying? And I just couldn't get my group. <laughs> I couldn't get my position. I couldn't get what I was there for. And I said, Lord, you just brought me to be a translator. You just brought me to do this. I don't want to do this. I came with an agenda. Don't you know? <laughs> so anyways, it was, um, it was a lot of surrendering. It was a lot of leaving my, my desires and my wants for what is it that you want, Lord? What do you require of me? Why did you bring me here? And when I was able to do that, let me tell you what he did. It was just seeing behind the scenes everything that those kids need. There was this boy that I got to spend a lot of time with. His name is Justin Bieber. <laughs> Believe it or not, his mother put Justin because of Justin Bieber. That's a true story. And his brother's name was Jeffrey. And they got to spend the whole week with us. But you know what? They were not going inside the classrooms. They were staying outside with us. And I kept asking my question, question why? Why you're not in school? Well, because my, our parents did not put us in school. So that really hit me really, really hard. And to see their desire, to see their wants, I want to be like those kids but I can because I am not allowed to for whatever reason. So the Lord opened an opportunity for us to go check their home and speak with their mother and see why. Why do you, you don't go, they're not going to school? And we found out that the mother earns $2 per day. Imagine that $2 per day has nine children. So the best thing that they can do is help, you know, put them into to work on the farms so they can earn money, so they can be able to eat. So you see, we have it all. We are rich here. And that just kept like stirring in my heart. And it just, it was 
you know, I come from all of that. I actually grew up in a, in a, in a neighborhood like that. We went to school by the grace of God. I am here by the grace of God. And it just stirred a lot of things in me. And it was hard to see that. It was hard to see their, their desire or their dreams that maybe they're not going to fill it up because of lack of money, lack of resources, right? The mother has a second grade education. So for her, it's not important. Education is not important. So we went through those feelings, those emotions, and I kept asking, so why are we here, Lord? Why is the purpose? Is it just to come and give them hugs? Is it just to come and, and tell them about, you know, about your word? Yes, we, we are supposed to tell them about the word, but what, what is next? And, you know, those emotions just kept flooding to me. The second day that we were there, I ran out of steam. I have no energy. Like, we were sweating the whole time. The kids require a lot of artation. We were playing nonstop with them. We were singing and worshiping and teaching and running from one place to another. And by the next day, by noon, I had no energy whatsoever. I was like, what am I going to do? I can't even move my finger. I was that exhausted. And I remember everybody, it was lunchtime, and we started to worship the Lord. And we started to sing, and I started pouring my heart and say, Lord, what is next? And all of a sudden, energy started coming, and I just started getting filled of the spirit and filled of, the, of his presence. And that gave me the energy for the next of the four or five days that we had. And I couldn't believe that it was the second day, and I had run out of energy. But you know what? The thing is that it wasn't my plan that it was done. It was God's plan. It was his will that we were there. And each, all of us were poured into those children. And those children got so much love. And that's what we wanted to show them. We wanted to show them God's love. We wanted to show them that God is real. And one of the questions that I asked was, what is your dream? I asked that to the woman. I asked that to the children. What is your dream? What do you want to be? And there was this sixth grader at uh, Savannah that she kept following me, following me, and following me. And of course, all the kids, doctors and teachers and everybody wanted to say, right? But this little girl, she kept following me. And finally, she whispered in my ears and she said, can I have a moment with you? And I said, yes, but nobody will leave us. Everybody always was there. I was always surrounded by kids. They would not leave us. So she started pushing everybody, get out, get away, get out. I want to talk to her, get away. And finally, we got them um, up to maybe three kids that did not listen, and they just stayed. And she whispered to, say, to me, and she said, I want to be a ballerina. Do you think that's a good dream? And, you know, I was so happy that I got the opportunity to say, that is a wonderful dream. Keep dreaming, and God will give you the desires of your heart. If you give your life to Christ, God will give you the desires of your heart. And, you know, it, it was just pouring those affirmative words in the mothers, not to mention the mothers. We got this opportunity to, to bless the mother, to lead them into, into um, forgiveness, how important it is for people to forgive. So we had those opportunities. And while I was asking God what next, I got this journal. And I decided to get everybody's hands print. And what do I do with this? What, sure what's next? The mic, one oh, here. what do I do with it? Look. So this book uh, journal is full of the handprints of all the children I came in contact. And I guess one of the visions the Lord gave me was maybe we can do a mural on the prayer room with all the fingerprints, all the handprints, that we all can be praying and interceding for the children. Because um, I remember I was that child where somebody was praying and interceding for me. So what is next? Well, this is what is next for me. See, Ted Stott said, some wish to live within the sound of church in chapel bell, 
I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Thank you. Isn't that awesome? Much, much better than a sermon, right? So I'm going to preach now. I'm going to go for about 40 minutes. No, um, no mis mission is important. Like we do, we do mission to impact people out there, but the majority of the time, mission impacts us. Um, a couple of reflections from me from this time. One of the things, when you go to a culture where you cannot speak the language, you're forced to learn to love and interact and pay attention without your words. You realize very quickly how often our words are the problem. Like, we felt loved by these kids running up and hugging us. We felt loved by the team as they worshiped and smiled. Um, and so many of our interactions that were impactful to us, to their community, was us trying to learn how to love people without knowing what they needed, without being able to communicate it with them. There were a couple of times where I'm like, if I could speak Spanish, I'd probably not be playing six hours of soccer with the kids. I would be over in a corner trying to share the gospel with a principal and, and not giving love where it needed to go. And, and so I found myself reflecting when you come back here, you're surrounded by people who need to be seen and known and loved. And sometimes the best thing you can do is keep your mouth shut and pay attention to the needs that they have. Hug them, bless them, encourage them. The other thing, uh, can you put the other picture up, uh, Aaron? Picture of the full team. <clears throat> this is uh, probably the, the biggest reflection for me of this trip is this well. So um, when we posted on Facebook that they'd estimated the well was 194 gallons a minute, um, so the group here in the US is called Honduras Well Projects. The group in Honduras is called Agua Viva, which is living water, um, or Agua Viva International. But they, um, they posted online, we think this might be the record for the largest producing well that we've done here, and they've been doing this for years. Um, and then we're like, oh, this is really exciting. Let's get it confirmed. And then they confirmed that the, the previous like max well was 168 gallons a minute. This one's 194. And then they tell us we had the pump on less than half pressure. So Joe said 350, that's conservative. Probably double what we had coming out of it, closer to 400 gallons a minute coming out as well. And when you're doing a project like this, we didn't put the water there. We didn't choose what community we were drilling in. Uh, it was like the week and a half before where they, like, we know what we're prepping because we're doing it in a school. We didn't know what the location was. They tell us like 10 days before, okay, we think we've finally got your location. Um, the community decides where they want the well. It has to be in public places. So they decided they wanted it in the school. The principal just says, I think I want it over there. This was not like we went in and surveyed and made sure there was gonna be water there for you to dig. This was like a whole bunch of random coincidences. So we didn't choose, we didn't do something special that made this the best well. But God decided of all the thousands of trips that have gone over to Honduras to dig these wells for our church to have the one that created the greatest abundance of water by nothing that we did. Um, and I just sat back at one point and God said, that's what I'm doing in your church. Not because of what we're doing, not because we're amazing, but because of what he's doing around us, because of our willingness to go and to do the things that he's asking us to do. I will bring an abundance like nothing you can ever imagine if you'll just trust me. Um, so this picture for me is the parable of God's promise to our church and to you as part of the church, that if you will posture yourself in generosity, if you'll give yourself to listening to him and following him, silencing yourself and being attentive to the needs of the people around you, he will break out in your life in abundance and do a greater impact in you than what we saw during this trip. So here's what I wanna do to finish. Uh, I'd love you to break into some little groups um, and pray for Honduras. 
Um, we went and we impacted these kids. We met them and then we left. Um, we've left them with a water well and we got to preach to them the, uh, the woman at the well and the living water that Jesus offers. So take some time to pray that, um, that every time they drink from this well, they'll be reminded of the living water that they've been offered. That these kids, as they grow up, will grow up with a memory of these seven people uh, loving them, and, or I guess there's nine because we had two others join us, that, that those memories of, of the impact and the connection that were made would be lasting. And then if you think about what Mark was sharing, there's some big infrastructure challenges as they think about what they want to do next and pray for the provision of what they need to take things forward. So break into groups, take a little moment to pray. These guys will come off the stage and then we'll finish with a little bit more worship. <laughs>